This episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Byron Seeds. The folks at Byron Seeds believe organic requires a different perspective, plan, and approach. Organic isn't simply a different type of product or even a different way of farming. It's a different way of thinking, planning, commitment. It's a different philosophy on how to feed the world. Many won't understand, but the people at Byron Seeds do. We're owned by organic dairy farmers. We not only have the product, but we plan, manage, and execute organic. We speak your language, we share your struggles, and we laud your successes. Organic isn't a way of doing business, it's a community. We learn from each other. We're in this together. We'd be glad to talk cropping plans, management systems, the road to profitability. We understand what you're trying to do. We're farmers just like you. Visit us at byronseeds.net or give us a call at 800-801-3596. And thanks to Byron Seeds. You're listening to Back to the Roots podcast. And today uh, we have a, a guest that we already had on, on episode six. It's John Kempf. And I think most people listening are probably familiar with John. Uh, he is the founder of Advancing Eco Ag and a, and a big name within the regenerative agriculture world, as well as a fellow podcaster. And um, John, I think, uh, you know, since most people are familiar with you, uh, we don't need to do a full on introduction. Um, so I think we'll just kick it off with, um, you know, I was going through a backlog of your podcast coming here, and I got to admit that I'm far further back than I'd like because I feel the need to sit down and take notes because some of the stuff you go into is extremely in depth. And so I feel like I'm a, a kindergartner sitting next to a doctorate right now. So I <laughs> uh, need to dumb it down to my level here. <laughs> and uh, I think where I want to start is one of the common themes in going back through some of your old podcasts is uh, carbon. And it's a big thing right now, you know, regenerative ag and carbon sequestration. And uh, you, you talked a little bit about that we need to change the way that we talk about that. And it's not carbon sequestration, it's carbon cycling. But before we go to that, I guess I want to just break it down to what is carbon and what role does it play in the soil? Sure. Well, thanks for having me back on. I've been looking forward to this conversation. So when we think about carbon and carbon in the ecosystem, uh, there's today, because of the, um, I'll say the politics of climate change, perhaps even uh, more so than the science of climate change, there is all this conversation about the need for carbon sequestration. And the discussion revolves around the capacity of agriculture to sink and absorb carbon into the soil and build organic matter and so forth. And I think this is a great conversation to be having because there is a need to regenerate our soils. There is a need to sequester carbon. But from my perspective, we're having the conversation for the wrong reasons. Um, in the podcast interview that I had with Walter Yenny, he really described how one of the most, not one of the most, but the single most significant greenhouse gas is in fact water vapor, water vapor in the upper atmosphere. And um, the water vapor, my understanding is that the water vapor in the atmosphere has not been included in the climate models historically, simply because we haven't had good enough data to know how to model it. And yet its contribution to warming and to climate instability is significantly greater than carbon dioxide or any of the other greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide and so forth. So Walter's perspective, which I've come to really respect and appreciate, is that, yes, we do need to increase our carbon stores in soil. We do need to increase organic matter. We do need to regenerate soil health. But not for the purpose of just sequestering carbon, but instead for the purpose of regenerating our hydrological cycles, regenerating our, our uh, the small, small water cycle, the large water cycle, so that we have 
high quality cloud cover that can effectively cool and heat as it was intended to, as it was supposed to, and so that we bring equilibrium to our rainfall patterns and so forth. So I find it intriguing. Um, I tend to not get too deep into the climate change conversations because um, I think today we, in, in the context of regenerative agriculture, we're having this conversation about carbon sequestration and it's the right conversation to have, but we're having it for the wrong reasons. And that's a bit concerning because uh, when I look at some of the new data that is coming out of the IPCC on solar particle forcing, um, the, the climate models that are used that are predicting global warming and describing warming are about to change significantly when the next model is released next year in 2022 because they're going to include a completely new set of data that has not been included before, which is this uh, concept of solar particles coming in and solar particle forcing. And this is really intriguing because it's been quite a while since I looked at this, probably nine months or more. But the last I looked at it, the when the solar particle forcing data was first released, uh, the way the process looks is that in 2019, I'm a bit fuzzy on the date, so I could easily be mistaken here, but uh, I think in 2019, the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, for the first time, had a large enough data set on different solar particles coming in that could be included in the climate models. And they said, okay, we have not included these in our models historically because we didn't have good data. But now we have good data. Here's the database. All of you scientists, they, they made it a publicly accessible and available to anyone. Here's the data. You include this and incorporate this into the models and see what the outcomes are. When I last looked at this about nine months ago, there had been 190 papers published of different scientists looking at the solar particle forcing data and including it into their climate models. And when they included that data, the universal conclusion of every single paper was that 100% of the increases in temperature and climactic instability could be attributed to the solar particle forcing, not to greenhouse gases. This has been a complete blackout in the media. No one is talking about it. But if that trend continues and the scientists continue to agree on this, in 2022, when the IPCC releases its new climate model, all of a sudden, the conversation about carbon and carbon dioxide being the primary greenhouse gas kind of goes up in smoke. And so my concern is that if we frame the conversation around the need for regenerative agriculture exclusively around climate change and carbon sequestration, all of a sudden the argument and the need for regenerative agriculture could disappear in a couple of years, which I think would be a grave mistake. Mm -hmm. So... Um, anyway, I went down a very different rabbit hole from the question that you asked. <laughs> but uh, when we think about what is carbon and how is it needed to cycle, the, the discussion has been around carbon sequestration, but in reality, we need to cycle carbon. Carbon is intended to be released from the soil, from microbial respiration, just the exact same way that we breathe, we inhale oxygen, and we release carbon dioxide, aerobic bacteria in soil do exactly the same thing. They consume oxygen and they release carbon dioxide. And that process of these, this exhalation of carbon dioxide from the tons of organisms in the soil profile results in a release of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And what should be happening is that our soils should be covered with green photosynthesizing plants that immediately capture that carbon dioxide and put it back into plant residue and put it back into the soil profile. So you have this loop that is constantly flowing from soil microbes to into the atmosphere, being captured by plants, being sent back out through the root system as it exudates to feed soil microbes, and it just continues. The, foundational, the foundation of fertility, the foundation of yield, the foundation of crop performance is in the volume of carbon that you can cycle. We really shouldn't care so much about, from, from a plant health and farm health perspective, we shouldn't care so much about how much carbon we capture and store. We should care instead about the quantity of carbon that we cycle. Because the more volume that we are cycling, 
the more we're photosynthesizing, the more we're feeding biology. And what happens as we, as we cycle larger and larger volumes of carbon, a small percentage of that bleeds off and gets stored. And I haven't done the math. I don't know exactly how big that percentage is, but let's, for the sake of discussion, say it's 10%. So the, we, just putting that number out there means that if we can increase, if we think of this as a percentage, the more volume we cycle, the greater the quantity will be that we actually successfully sequester in long-term stable soil carbon. And is, is there a crop or is there a cropping system that does the best cycling or is, is basically green plants, green plants? Well, some ecosystems are certainly more efficient than others. Um, there's some research that I've heard about, I haven't actually read, that described in the North American temperate latitudes, the three ecosystems that are the most effective at sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, the number one most effective was an early growth stage conifer forest. The second was a perennial polyculture with intensively managed rotational grazing with different uh, perennials in it, grasses and forbs and so forth. And the third comes as a surprise to most people, but it was actually corn. So those in, within the growing season, as uh, for corn, the challenge with a corn crop is that you only have a vegetative period for, what, six weeks or so, in about 42 days. It goes from being a seed to tasseling or something like that. It grows from a seedling to tasseling. So for the rest of the growing season, you are not absorbing carbon dioxide very efficiently. So it's extremely efficient for a short window of time. But the question we should be asking is, is that really effectively feeding soil biology and what proportion of that overall cycle is actually being kept long term? Uh, and it might be a much smaller, it probably is much smaller than it is with a perennial system. So those are the three ecosystems that I've heard are the most efficient in our North American temperate latitudes. But the piece, I think the foundational piece that has been missed in so much of regenerative agriculture is that photosynthesis is not static. It's not a set engine that runs at 1500 RPM constantly. It is very variable and the variables, uh, that variability means that one field or one plant might be photosynthesizing as much as three to four times faster than the next plant right beside it. And this is why we can have conversations about higher bricks plants and lower bricks plants. That's an analog for photosynthetic efficiency and for how fast that engine is running. So there's this idea that we just need to keep our soils covered with green growing plants all the time. And that's true. But what if you could get that engine to run four times faster? How much is that actually worth? And this is where I think... Um, not enough credit has been given historically to the possibilities of managing nutrition and managing biology specifically to increase that photosynthesis. And um, I'll add in one more piece, which is the Bible talks about the fat of the land. And stable organic matter, stable humic substances, are about 40% lipids, 40% fats. So I believe that when we talk about the fat of the land we're really having a conversation about carbon storage, organic matter building in soil as a result of microbial activity and accumulating fats in organic matter. That really is the fat of the land. That really is the fertility of the land that is a re comes about as a result of large amounts of carbon cycling, not just carbon sequestration. Interesting. I had never heard the fat of the land described that way. <laughs> Intriguing. It's really, when you look at um, stable humic substances, they are described as having a lipophilic acid content ranging from a low of 38% to a high of 42%. So this means we know that uh, if we're analyzing forages for a dairy rations, a forage can have as low as 1.5% fat content on a dry matter basis, and it can have as high as a 6% or 7% fat content. This means that for the crop residue or the forage residue that gets trampled into the soil by uh, hoves and hoof action or the root exudates and the root pruning that happens, when you have this high fat content uh, plant residue, 
that's going to build organic matter much faster than low fat plant, uh, low fat content plant residue, because it's really the fat content that builds stable organic matter. And the fat content in the forage feed has a much higher energy. Absolutely. So, and energy for a dairy cow translates into milk. And energy is critical. We can we can grow more protein than we know what to do with. But on organic dairy or pasture fed dairies in particular, our constant challenge is getting enough energy. And you can supply. This is a you can easily for for cows that are optimized for grazing. You can easily supply 100% of a cow's energy requirements to produce 55 pounds of milk per head per day at 6% fat content forage. You do not need any grain supplementation. Most farmers don't get to experience that because their forages aren't healthy enough. Yeah, I have. we have one grass mill farmer that uh, has high fat levels, and it he's a grass-fed dairy, and it directly shows up in his bulletin. And How does so- it show up? As milk, <laughs> I mean, and it's his production is up. His well, when you look at the production starts in the soil, so his his grazing cycle is shorter than most people because of the production he's getting on his fields, and then it's directly relating into the energy that the cow needs. So they're not consuming as much because they're they're going to eat till they reach their energy requirement. Yeah. But even in his stored feed. It's not nearly taking the feed that it used to take because he's getting his fat levels up. Exactly. And you mentioned a critical piece, which is the productivity and shortening the grazing cycle. When we look at yield and productivity, again, from this perspective of carbon cycling and increasing photosynthesis, the optimal from a holistic management, a holistic planned grazing perspective, is to keep those plants in the vegetative stages as much as possible because it is in those vegetative stages where they're photosynthesizing very efficiently and where they're building biomass very efficiently and very rapidly. So the key is to grow these plants from minimum grazing height, let's say four to six inches or whatever it is, up until approaching maturity or saying in a different way is until that growth curve starts flattening out and we have thought historically of this growth curve from and the optimal vegetative stages in the context of rainfall and latitude and grass species to say that depending on the grass species depending on your latitude sunlight depending on your water availability This could be 30 days, or it could be 40 days, or 60 days, or whatever it is, depending on the environment. But this, again, misses the aspect of increasing that photosynthesis engine. So let's go to a completely different um, crop, and a completely different perspective. So what we're talking about with forages is really growing a vegetative crop. So other vegetative crops uh, would be alfalfa, or kale, or spinach. I'm going to pick on spinach. When we're growing, when we're working with spinach farmers in California, we can take a crop that normally takes 45 days to grow from seed to harvest and cut that down to 32 days, simply with nutrition management and increasing photosynthesis. So that means, think about, you are talking about a reduction of 30% in the time that it takes to reach a certain amount of biomass. You can do the exact same thing with forage production, where this vegetative growth curve, instead of now taking 40 or 50 days, might only take 20 days. And that's where you... Not only can you shorten your grazing cycle, but you need to from an optimal plant management perspective. And then to throw another curve into that manage it with grazing is your stocking density has to be right. Because I think I think we actually have some people that are understocked. So now the pastors are getting ahead of them. And if they go through too fast, you know, they're not they're not grazing it down like it should be. So I think stocking density is a much bigger, f- important factor in that system. Well, stocking density, from what I've observed, and I'm not an expert in this, but from what I've just observed experientially, I would say as plant health improves and as this overall cycle improves, stocking density needs to go up because... What happens, all of a sudden, a crown of an alfalfa plant or the, a, the crown of um, orchard grass, instead of having sending up 10 new spears on a new shoot growth, of new shoot growth after grazing, it sends up 20. So you actually, your, your plant population may not appear to be that much higher if you actually do a plant count. 
but the or a crown count, but the number of blades that are coming up on every square foot is significantly higher. I, I want to just make sure I'm understanding, like going back to the milk production example and tying it back to carbon here. Am I understanding it correct? So carbon helps to create organic matter and organic matter is where that fat, the fat of the land is, right? And then that is put into the plant. That fat is the higher the organic matter, the more fat that can be put into the plant, which is then converted into milk or so, whatever, more biomass. Let me connect a couple of dots that we haven't connected yet, which is that it's a question of how do plants absorb nutrition from the soil? That was the, the, the piece that was missing in those dots you connected, and you did connect them correctly in principle. What happens, mainstream agronomy, for the benefit of the, or I shouldn't say for the benefit, I believe this was directly engineered by the companies selling chemical fertilizers, uh, the model of agronomy that has been adopted over the last however many decades, seven decades or so, has been a model that describes plants absorbing simple ions from the soil solution, so calcium ions, magnesium ions, nitrate ions, and so forth. And if our understanding is that plants are absorbing simple ions from the soil solution, then it makes sense to add fertilizers, which are also simple ions. And plants do have the capacity to do this because this is how hydroponics works. But if we use this model in our production agriculture, it's a really stupid idea. It's, it's glorified hydroponics. The way plants are actually designed to absorb nutrients is, uh, there's been some fascinating research by Dr. James White from Rutgers University where he describes plants actually feeding on entire bacterial cells and absorbing entire bacteria. And this is absolutely fascinating because what he's describing is that as a growing root tip grows through the soil, it engulfs these entire living bacteria. And then when these bacteria enter into the root system, the plant uh, in, in the root, they get exposed to superoxide and nitrous oxide, which are very strong oxidizing agents, and they strip off the cell membranes. So now you have these naked bacterial cells inside the plant root, and these naked bacterial cells begin falling apart, and the plant cells, the root cells, absorb either parts or, in some cases, these entire naked bacterial cells and use them as an energy source. This is the way plant nutrition is really designed to work. It's the way that it works out in natural native ecosystems. No one fertilizes the trees. No one fertilizes the shrubs and things that are growing in wild ecosystems. They get their nutrition from this process of absorbing living bacteria. And James White has given a name to this process that he calls rhizophagy, which means root feeding. But the next part of this process is also really amazing in that some of the naked cells that have their cell membranes stripped from them survive this process. And as they move back through the root system, they trigger the formation of root hairs. And so now you have these root hairs going out from the sides of the root and these bacteria migrate out through the root hairs back into the soil environment. And the fascinating part is that plants now release mucilage and sugars and amino acids, precisely what those bacteria need to reform their cell membranes. And as these bacteria made their pathway through the inside of this root system, the plant is also signaling to them what nutrients it requires, saying, hey, I need more phosphorus or I need more manganese. So now these bacteria go back out into the soil environment and they extract more phosphorus and manganese and they also communicate that requirement to the rest of the soil's microbial community. So then the next root tip comes along and engulfs those bacteria that contain higher levels of phosphorus and contain higher levels of manganese and that's how the plant gets its nutritional requirements. So plants are farming bacteria the same way that we farm livestock which means that plants are not vegetarians. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but this is, a, so this is a different model of plant nutrition, and this comes back to our carbon conversation and our, and our carbon, um, our fat content conversation. Because the difference between a plant that has 1.5% fat content on a dry matter basis versus 6% fat content dry, on a dry matter basis 
is which types of nutrients they absorb. When a plant absorbs simple ions like nitrate ions and calcium and magnesium ions, it costs them a lot of energy to convert those simple ions into their own compounds. So they, if as they're photosynthesizing, producing all this sugar, it costs a lot of sugar to convert all those compounds, which means that that sugar is now not able to be sent out to the root system as root exudates to feed soil biology. So feeding plants fertilizers comes at two costs. One is it negatively affects soil biology directly, but secondly, it also prevents the plants from feeding soil biology. That's an important piece that many people are not aware of. Versus the alternative is when plants are consuming these entire bacterial cells, it was the bacteria that now expended the energy of getting the calcium and the magnesium ions from the soil mineral matrix and incorporating them into their own cells. And for the plants, it's the equivalent of getting prefab parts. They don't need to expend all this energy. So now all of a sudden they have surplus energy. And what do we do when we have surplus energy? We store it as fat. Plants do exactly the same thing. So the, the simple summary is that in order to produce high fat content forages, plants must get the majority of their nutrition from consuming bacteria, not from consuming fertilizer. So let's say that, you know, you used manganese, let's just use manganese. Let's say the plant is sending a signal to that bacteria to go back out and find manganese and the soil is deficient in manganese. What happens then? And then I want to go to a bigger question of what comes first. And I don't know if I'm phrasing it right, but biology or chemistry? <laughs> Interesting questions. So to your first question, um, most soils, particularly across the Midwest and the Plains here in North America, most soils have tremendous nutrient reserves that do not show up on a soil analysis. So most of our soils will have anywhere from 200 to 400 parts per million manganese if you do a geological assay. And that's just in the top six inches. That's without going deeper than that. But if you do a typical soil analysis, you might have 10 or 20 parts per million showing up and sometimes less. The bacteria that the plant is feeding can access the total of 200 to 400 parts per million manganese, not just the 10 or 20 parts per million that shows up on a typical soil test. So think of it this way. When plants send sugars out through the root system, these sugars are, if you think about a simple sugar being produced during photosynthesis, glucose, glucose, uh, the, the chemistry uh, symbols for glucose are C6H12O6. And I point this out so that's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There are no minerals in sugar. There's no manganese. There's no zinc. There's no copper. There, there aren't, it's, sugar is devoid of all minerals, pure sugar. So the plant is sending these sugars out into the soil. And at the same time, it is signaling, signaling the bacteria that it requires manganese in the example that you mentioned. And the, plant, the bacteria also need manganese for their own cells anyway. So they consume this sugar, but they're not getting manganese from the plant. So they have to go to the soil mineral profile to get manganese and incorporate that into their own cells that the plant then consumes and feeds upon. So uh, in our consulting work over the last couple of years, we have started widely using a geological type assay. Uh, you only need to run one of these tests per soil type, per farm, ever. It's not something you need to keep doing over and over again. But you run this, um, these assays are commonly used in the mining industry to determine what is the total mineral content of this soil. And we find that this is very important information because you might have two farms that on a typical soil analysis both show that they're manganese deficient. They both might have, let's say, 10 parts per million manganese. But one farm has 400 parts per million manganese in the soil reserve, which the biology can access. And the next farm only has 10 parts per million. Maybe it has really sandy soil, or maybe it has a different type of foundational bedrock that didn't contain manganese. And so for that soil, it now makes sense to try to build manganese levels in the soil profile. But for the first soil, it's a waste of time and money. You have a tremendous reserve. Instead, you need to focus on building biology to get access to the reserves of manganese that you already have. 
So that kind of answers the question of what comes first. It depends on the soil type. It depends on the soil type, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. And um, I would answer the question of what comes first. The engine that drives this entire system is photosynthesis. That's why I'm so obsessed about the realization that photosynthesis is not a constant engine that runs at 1500 RPM. It can range from 100 RPM to 4000 RPM. And this engine, the more sunlight energy and carbon dioxide that it taps into and captures, it is that energy that feeds the microbial engine. So there's been this perception within the biological and organic agriculture community that we need to build healthy soil and then we can grow healthy crops. That's not incorrect, but it's backwards. It's the healthy crops that create the healthy soil in the first place. And so as a farmer, he's got to figure out what he needs to grow to fix his soil? Well, I would suggest, this is why I've been a fan of foliar applications, I would suggest you need to make certain that you address the nutrients that are needed to optimize photosynthesis. And it's a fairly short list. Um, the list, when, when we focus... When we laser focus just on increasing photosynthesis, the list of nutrients we need to address are, well, there's sunlight, there's water, there's carbon dioxide. For the sake of discussion, we'll assume those as being a given. And then in addition to that, there is magnesium, nitrogen, iron, and manganese. And the last two are particularly important because... Iron and manganese are almost universally deficient in plants, not in soil, but in plants, because the way that our soils have been mismanaged over the last several centuries, we have developed soil microbial populations that favor trace mineral oxidation instead of reduction. So iron and manganese exist in the soil in different oxidation states. Um, I'll use iron as, as an example in that uh, we know that when we have a piece of steel or iron, we take it outdoors, we expose it to the elements, the air, sunshine, and water, and it starts rusting. That rust is oxidized iron. And the majority of the iron in our soil profiles today that shows up on a soil test is in the form of rust, which plants can absorb but can't use. So if we run a forage analysis for a dairy, the majority of them will show that we have excessive levels of iron. And the test is wrong because what happens is the plant, the plant senses that it is iron deficient. And so it absorbs, it communicates this to the biology, to the bacteria, and it absorbs as much iron as it can. But once it's picked up this iron in, that is in the oxidized form, in the form of rust, it recognizes that it can't use it. And so it stores it as in vacuoles inside the cell. So that iron that is in the wrong form gets stored and never gets used. So it is there, it's in the plant, but it's not active. It might as well not be there. So as a result of that, most soil tests show that we have abundant iron. A forage analysis or tissue analysis will show that the crop has excessive levels of iron. And yet... If you go out and put on a foliar spray of iron, you get this tremendous plant response. You can get as big a plant response from foliar applying a quart or two of iron as you can from putting on 40 units of nitrogen. You get this, you can paint your name green on the lawn or out in the field because the plants are usually so deficient in iron and you get this tremendous iron response. And... Is that healthy for the plant to to just foliar spray iron on it? Um, for most crops in this day and age, the answer is yes. Most of our crops are iron deficient. And I've used iron as an example, but the same holds true of manganese. Our crops are almost universally deficient in manganese for the same reason. But it's in the soil. It's in the soil, but it's not plant available because we have mismanaged our soil biology. And... I need to uh, recognize we're talking, uh, the audience, our audience perhaps is a lot of dairy farmers and grazers and people who are growing forages and so forth. Um, The practices that, well, basically, 
anything that we add that would make iron rust has an oxidizing effect. So when you till your soils, tillage is the introduction of oxygen, that's oxidation, that's going to make iron rust. Um, adding salt fertilizers is an obvious one, particularly nitrates or any form of nitrogen will do this. Um, adding, this is going to come as a disappointment to many growers, adding manure that quickly converts to nitrate. So saying that a different way is adding manure that doesn't have enough carbon in it. So if we add liquid dairy manure or something else, I mean, how many people have challenges adding manure and they see that they had an earthworm kill? Well, that's going to have an oxidizing effect. Um, surprisingly enough, adding limestone. Limestone has an oxidizing effect. It's relatively slight compared to some of the others, but it still has an oxidizing effect. And so when you think about this, the way that our agriculture has evolved over the last however many decades, many of our cultural management practices have led to having an oxidizing effect on the soil. It was unintentional. We, didn't, we were ignorant. We didn't know what we were doing. But we were increasingly making our iron and manganese less available and less available and less available. So the solution to increasing that availability is having the right forms of bacteria, the right forms of biology. And um, legumes are really good at this. Legumes, uh, the, the rhizobial populations that are associated with legumes have a reducing effect and they can convert these trace minerals of iron and manganese back into the available form. So um, perhaps the simple way to say it is that we want soils, in order to cultivate the right microbial population, we need soils that have an abundant population of legumes that are not over aerated, that are not over oxidized. So we want soils that have good gas exchange but we do not want soils that are purely aerobic, which is directly contrary to what we've been told for a long time. So when you foliar spray that iron on, can you build the available iron in your soils by doing that? You shouldn't try. The intent is not to build iron in the soils. Okay. The intent is just to use the iron or the manganese foliar spray as the either to start the engine. Okay. is the either to start the photosynthetic engine. Because what happens, let's say your engine is what most people and the way that most crops are operating today is at photosynthesis, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20%. So let's say in an engine that can run 2,000 RPM, you're running at 400 RPM. So when you put on the foliar spray, the foliar spray only has one purpose, and that is to get that engine from 400 RPM up to, let's say, 1,500. It turbocharges it. And for that short period of time that the foliar spray is having an effect, that might be a month, two months, three months, depending on the crop and the context, but for that period of time, it ramps up that engine. And now, while this engine is running much faster, it produces a lot more sugars. And uh, in the case of going from 400 to 1500 RPM, it produces about four times more sugars every day in each 24-hour photo period. But that four times higher sugar content isn't going, you're not going to get four times higher yield or four times more production. So the question is, where does all the extra sugar go? And all the extra sugar goes out through the root system to feed soil biology. And now it's, you've changed the soil microbial community to such a degree that these bacteria begin converting the manganese and the iron. So we have, in many soils, we have abundant levels. We shouldn't try to build the levels that we have. Instead, we should tap into this photosynthesis engine. This is, again, why I'm such a fan of foliar applications, is I see them as a way to hack the system. You can put on a foliar application with two or three quarts per acre of product, and the result is that you get a thousand pounds more sugar in the carbon, in the soil profile, over the next three weeks. You can't afford to buy a thousand pounds more sugar and put it on but you can create that sugar by increasing plant photosynthesis. And that is the solution to increasing manganese and iron availability. And this is also kind of the crux of regenerative agriculture. In it general. absolutely is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It all comes down to photosynthesis. That's where it begins and that's where it ends. Because when you do that, we've been having this conversation about 
carbon cycling and building high fat content plants and plants getting nutrition from feeding on bacteria. The reality is when you have high levels of photosynthesis, all of that happens automatically. It doesn't require management. It was designed to work that way. You just increase photosynthesis and get out of the way and let the system work as, as it was designed to and as it was intended to. Mm -hmm. Now you could, let's just use hay as an example. You know, you've got 20 different species, you're grazing some, you're making some, let's just say you're in a grazing system. So would you recommend like hitting that with a foliar application after every cutting to try to maximize that photosynthesis after each grazing or once a year or how would you manage that? It depends on how healthy that soil or it depends on how healthy or unhealthy that soil and plant ecosystem is to begin with. Some that are really degraded, you need to put on an application after every grazing, every 21 or every 30 days, just to, for lack of a better term, constantly be putting those shots of ether into the system to keep the engine running faster. But then the healthier the system becomes, the, the fewer and fewer injections it needs to maintain that high RPM. So the intent is to use that for a period of time, a year, two years, whatever, whatever it takes for that local context, and then to transition off. And if you're not able to transition off in a couple of years, it means either A, you're not doing it correctly, or B, it means that your system was so incredibly degraded and your soil has so low mineral content that it may not really be optimal or possible. If you're growing on really sandy soils in Florida, for example, um, those crops and ecosystems may need constant close management for optimal performance. Mm -hmm. But you can't just use the ether as an analogy. Mm -hmm. You can blow up an engine by overusing ether. Absolutely, you can. So can you do the same thing with over-applying? No, because you can't increase photosynthesis beyond the resources available. So in other words, uh, you can't run photosynthesis any faster than the available carbon dioxide and the available water. Um, so this is actually another point, is putting in, the, putting in these foliar sprays um, it, this, this is a, our perspective of the engine isn't perhaps, our analogy of the engine isn't perhaps the best analogy because, um, with an engine, you expect an almost immediate response, but this is a natural system that kind of cycles over time. It's more like a snowball rolling downhill. It starts small, but it can rapidly build as it goes further downhill. So what happens is if you start on a pasture with a foliar application, you, let's say you do full, you have a really compromised ecosystem and you do foliar applications every 30 days to the growing season, just for the sake of discussion. If what can happen is that you may put on these foliar sprays in, in the first couple of applications and not get the response that you desired or hoped for because the soil and soil biology was at such a low level that it wasn't able to deliver enough carbon dioxide to get the photosynthesis response you expected. See, carbon dioxide is also needed. It's, it's the whole ecosystem has to work together. So it's kind of a compounding effect where every time you do it and every time you repeat it, you expect to get a bigger and bigger and bigger response. So I want to go to like, um, let's just add to the example here of growing hay. And let's say this is on ground that's been uh, conventionally farmed for years and years and years and the and we can talk a little bit about like the carbon uh, you know or the organic matter actually decreasing in the sub layer and all that kind of stuff um, but is there enough biology there to is there a situation where they're just it's been depleted so much that the biology is is not able to come back if that makes sense I'm always amazed at the incredible resilience of natural ecosystems and their extraordinary capacity to regenerate. Um, they do come back, they can come back, but in those soils, um, our experience has been that uh, we, we, do, we would not even attempt to rehabilitate those soils without adding inoculants back, whether in the form of compost tea or purchased inoculants or both. And we also set the expectation that it is going to take time. You can, with some some of the technology we have available today with the Johnson Sioux bioreactors, compost, and some of the stuff like that, 
we have some pretty extraordinary microbial products that can regenerate soil biology really quickly in terms of the species and populations that are present, but they need a food source. And so in the, in the situation that you described, you have to have green growing plants, you have to have some level of photosynthesis happening, and you have to recognize that you have an engine that's running at 100 RPM, and it's simply going to take time and effort to get it to run at 3,000 RPM. It's not going to happen. It's not going to go from zero to 3,000 that quickly. So I want to go back and talk a little bit about the salt, or I mean the iron. Mm -hmm. So there was an article recently that stated that a certain brand of salt has too much iron in it, and it is causing problems with cows. Is that factual or not? Because I had a lot of farmers call me concerned because they were feeding that brand of salt. And they've probably been feeding it successfully for a decade or more without any problems? Exactly. So there's your answer. <laughs> that was my thoughts, but I was I was still concerned because it does have way more iron in it than any other salt I've seen. Like 3,000 3, parts per million, I think. I'm, I'm not a dairy nutritionist, and uh, I don't know if I'm qualified to have an opinion on that topic, but do you realize how little 3,000 parts per million actually is? It's a very... When you do the math, if you convert that to uh, milligrams of iron, and you compare that to the grams of iron that you're getting from consuming 60 pounds of forages per day, you'll find that the salt is really inconsequential really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, that would be my proposal. I, I'm not the expert, but just do the math and you'll find that uh, I'm quite confident you'll find that 3,000 parts per million is 0.3%. Um, um, but you're only feeding, what, a couple of ounces of salt per day well, as compared to forages con consuming 60 pounds per day at a rate of 30 to 40 parts per million iron. So there's a... I don't really think it's something to be concerned about, but again, I'm not a dairy nutritionist. Mm -hmm. But my comment to the farmer that called me was, you fed it for 12 years. Have you had any reproductive issues? <laughs> no? <laughs> there you go. Okay. It's, I don't think it's broke. <laughs> Just because you read the an article, I don't think that broke the system. Well, we haven't mentioned any names. I have a suspicion of which type of salt you might be talking about, but uh, I don't know for sure. But if, if my suspicion is correct, it's a brand of salt that has been fed by the semi-truck load to tens of thousands of dairy cows for decades. That would be correct. All right. Well, then, where's the problem? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> if, a, an opinion piece. By someone who probably had a vested interest on the other side. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Enough said. <Yeah. laughs> So going into the, the foliar programs, how do you build a foliar program for somebody that, well, I'll just talk about what I have an opportunity to have 35 acres of pasture mm -hmm. that's been pasture, run the cows out all year for the last 20 years. No inputs on it, nothing. I mean, it was basically just grazed off, but there were cattle on it. Mm -hmm. um, where do you start? So where I would start... And I'll, I'll take a, um, a no-science approach. Well, in, in our consulting work at AEA, we very much like to measure with SAP analysis data and with soil data. But what I can just say as a general blanket approach is what we generally find when we do collect the data is that the nutrients which are missing, which are blocking, or I should say, which are bottlenecking photosynthesis, are the nutrients that I mentioned being magnesium, nitrogen, manganese, and iron. So if you want a very simple, low input, low ball starting point, just begin with those four and see what happens. Um, now, it's entirely possible if you do that, it's entirely possible that you may have something else that is severely deficient in the ecosystem that you maybe should measure for. So if you have severely depleted calcium, for example, then addressing these other four things is going to help, but it's you're you're stick you're quickly going to come up against that threshold of calcium being the bottleneck at that point. Um, but those would be the four nutrients that I would start with as just a very simple entry point. And as as an organic operation, nitrogen is always expensive. Nitrogen what, is what expensive. Is and the form of nitrogen you would put on? I should clarify. I'm not suggesting you need to add each of those four. You need okay. to make sure that your crop has enough of each of those four. So if you're growing forages with a combination of legumes in it and you have plenty of nitrogen, then why would you need to buy more? Um, 
In terms of the magnesium and manganese and iron, the manganese and iron, it's critical that they need to be in both the reduced form and they need to be chelated. And I'll describe why in just a moment. Let's come back to magnesium. Magnesium can be as simple as Epsom salts. Magnesium sulfate, foliar, three to four pounds per acre, every application. The manganese and the iron need to be both in the reduced form and they need to be chelated. So if you're not familiar with the terminology in the lexicon, being in the reduced form is the opposite of being in the oxidized form. So instead of being iron being in the form of rust, it is now in the reduced form, which means it has a it's Fe plus plus with a double positive, whereas the oxidized form is a triple or a quadruple positive. And it needs to be chelated. The reason it needs to be chelated, so let's just say, let's take manganese sulfate, for example. You can buy uh, feed grade manganese sulfate and dissolve it in water. Now manganese sulfate the manganese that is contained within that is in the double positive form. It's in the reduced form. It is in the form that plants can absorb. That's a good thing. The problem is when you dissolve it in water and you spray it onto a leaf surface, when it lands on the leaf surface, that droplet dries out and it gets exposed to oxygen and now it immediately oxidizes. So you bought the right form of manganese, but the form of manganese that ended up on the plant's leaf surface is not what you bought. So that's why it has to be chelated. So, uh, and you'll quickly see this from a plant response perspective as well, is that when you get chelated manganese and iron, when it's chelated, now it's stable and it doesn't react to the oxygen in the atmosphere. And so it stays in the reduced form. And then the whole goal behind getting on this foliar program and tying it back to what we were talking about earlier is the whole goal is to kickstart the system. It's to kickstart photosynthesis, get that engine running faster. Which then gets and, the whole yeah, cycle going. Maybe the way to say this, um, just to kind of tie it all together, is we want that engine to run as fast as the carbon dioxide released from the soil permits. So that gives us a threshold to bump up against. If we have soils that uh, are really compromised, that have been farmed out as the one situation that you described where organic matter is really depleted and there's almost no soil biology. We have to recognize that we can put on a foliar application and we're going to get a spike, but we're probably not going to go from 100 parts per million to 3,000 parts per million because there is no reserve of carbon dioxide coming from the soil to build from. So you might go from 100 to 300 parts per million, and then you're going to have to repeat that application and go from 300 to 400, and it's going to take a period of time to, because what we also have to do by constantly triggering this photosynthesis engine is we have to build enough, we, we have to increase the volume of our carbon cycling. Early on, the volume of carbon cycling is very small because there's, practically no soluble carbon left in the soil profile and we have to rebuild that and we have to get that cycle restarted with the eventual intention to basically step back stay out of the way and exactly. let the process happen which is the if, exact opposite of the way it, like what led to that depleted field in the first place exactly right is the exact opposite way of everything that's been taught and done for the last exactly right and i think one of our biggest success is it's, it's interesting to me in, in our work with AEA. You, we start working with farmers. We develop deep relationships with them. They get really excited and enthusiastic about the results they're seeing. And then after a couple of years, they don't need us anymore. <laughs> so it's really rewarding and uh, a bit, uh, it's, an, it's an intriguing dynamic for sure that we work ourselves out of a job. <laughs> it's, it's a little different business model. <laughs> But there's it, enough acres out there that need yeah, the, It means we constantly need to get new customers. Right. And luckily, that's not been a problem. <laughs> but so one of the things we were talking about before we got started here was what led to that in the first place of the uh, control over uh -huh. the soil. And how did we get there? This is, this is such an intriguing question. This is something I've been thinking about for the last several months. Our, our success in our work at AEA has really come about as a result of constantly trying to understand what is the root cause? 
what's the foundational cause of why we have a specific problem? So what is the foundational cause? What's the, what are the root causes of why we have aphids on this soybean plant? And you ask that question and you stick with that question, you will eventually come up with answers. And those answers, when asked in that way, will usually revolve around some type of nutrient interaction or microbial interaction or combination of both. But then you can step back a little bit and you ask a little bit different question to say, why do we have aphids in this field? How is this field being managed that allows aphids to be present? And you step back a little bit further and you ask, why is this farmer managing his farm in a way that allows aphids to be present? And it's really this last question that uh, asking the question in this way from a different perspective, um, I started asking an, an associated question of what is what are our beliefs that limit us, that are so deeply held, that have allowed us to develop an agriculture that degrades the natural resources, degrades the environment, degrades the ecosystem. And uh, there are some people within agriculture who dislike the term regenerative, and they dislike it because it implies that the agriculture which is presently mainstream is in some regards degenerative, and they dislike that implication. But the reality is, it's true. We have severely degraded our topsoils. We have severely degraded our ecosystems. And anyone who wants to have a conversation about that should first consider the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, along with many other ecological degradations that have come about as a result of our agricultural practices. So I started asking the question, what, is, what are the deeply held beliefs that we hold as a civilization or have held as a civilization that have given us the permission to adopt an agricultural model that is so damaging and rape and pillage and think that that is okay. And I've come to the conclusion that um, there are some deeply held beliefs within our Judeo-Christian worldview of many of the immigrants from Europe to here in North America that are at the foundation of these beliefs, uh, that are at the foundation of giving us permission to adopt this approach to agriculture. And two of them are, uh, one of them is the belief that we are here to have dominion over. And the second is the belief that the earth is cursed. And so let's take each one of these at a time. Uh, there is... Uh, in Genesis and a couple of different places, it's described how we are to have dominion over uh, all the living creatures. When you look at what, uh, when you look at the original Hebrew, and when you look at what that word dominion meant 300 years ago as compared to today, today we perceive that word to mean that we are to dominate and that we are to subjugate to our desires and to our wishes. But in reality, what it was intended to communicate originally was that we have a responsibility to steward, which is a completely different ethos. It's a completely different perspective than dominating. And the second belief, the belief that the earth is cursed, our, our work at AEA has been based on the principle and the idea that you can manage plant nutrition in such a way that you can produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases, that are completely resistant to all insects, and that when you do this, uh, we are not at the stage where we're suggesting we will never have weeds, but weed populations really shift and change on our annual crops, and of course on our perennials, like a uh, perennial um, grazing system, there technically is no such thing as a weed. All plants can be consumed by livestock. And... So we've developed this different perspective, and um, some people have asked the question, well, doesn't I thought we're always going to have weeds and insects, because after all, the earth is cursed, the land is cursed. But in fact, it's not cursed. It's intriguing to me how we have had blinders on and have completely missed the things. And we don't even need to go to the New Testament. We don't even need to go to salvation and the idea that um, this was all renewed after the act of salvation. 
in uh, the the quote, the, the reference that I would ask people to look up is Genesis 8.21. So Genesis 8.21 is after Noah emerged from the ark, he offered a burnt offering and uh, God smelled this aroma. And I'm used to reading this in German, so I'll give it a shot in English, but you can look it up. Um, God smelled the burnt offering and he said... I will never again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the thoughts and imaginations of a man's heart are evil from the days of his youth. We all remember the second part of that sentence, that the thoughts and imaginations of a man's heart are evil from the days of his youth. But the first part of that sentence says, I will never again curse the ground any more for man's sake. There it is. The curse has been removed. So that means if we believe that we will always have insects and we will always have diseases and we will always have to deal with weeds, then that will become true for us because that's what we believe to be true. But that is not the plan that God had in mind for us. And this all comes from a mistranslation or a misreading? It comes from a mistranslation and misperceptions of what is actually being said. And so I believe it's, it's these foundational incorrect beliefs that have given us permission. We think we have permission to dominate. We think we have permission to, to destroy and degrade soils. But in reality, it is our responsibility to steward. And when we steward well in alignment with God's design and in alignment with his intentions, then the ecosystem that he designed begins performing beautifully, beautifully and aligns with us. See, when we stop to think about it, creation is not something that just happened at one moment in time in the beginning. Creation is something that happens new each moment. Every moment is a new creation. And if we believe that we are the sons and daughters of God, and the brethren of Christ, um, I believe that that means we are co-creators with God of our reality each and every moment, that we are here to be his messengers on earth and to steward his creation. And hmm, I had another important thought that I wanted to add there. Oh, when we are the stewards of his creation, that means that we are in alignment and that we have a covenant with all the living things that he has created. There's a verse in Job that I really like. Um, I think it's Job 8.23, but I could be mistaken. But he talks about, um, he's talking about the threats and the potential of famine and droughts. And he's saying, for you shall never have, you shall never need to fear drought, you shall never need to fear famine in the land because you shall have a league, you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field, and the wild beasts shall be at peace with you. So I started digging into what does it, what does it really mean to have a covenant with the stones of the field? And one translation says you shall be in league with the stones of the field. And some people have um, ascribed that translation as being the boundary markers that were used to mark the boundaries of properties. But that doesn't really make sense in the context that a boundary marker doesn't necessarily benefit you when in for drought resilience or famine resilience. So what if being in league with the stones of the field really means being in league with the minerals of the soil and, and having a covenant with nutrition and having good nutrition in the soil? I suspect that is what is really intended to be communicated there. So we are, we should have the ethos for, for us. If we are coming from a Christian perspective, it should be our desire to have a relationship with God's creation where we are stewards. And this may come across as being harsh. I think Many people acknowledge this verbally. Oh, yes, we want to do that. But there are many farmers of an Anabaptist or Christian background whose actions say something different from their words. Are you really a steward of God's creation if you have 20,000 hens packed into a poultry barn? 
Is that really a steward of what that, uh, how that chicken would desire to live its life? Or say that a different way, how God would desire that chicken to live out its life? And how he designed it to thrive and to function? So, I suggest we need to take a really hard, serious look at the models of agriculture that we have adopted from the perspective of stewardship. And I would challenge anyone, if you want to dig into this more deeply, one of my favorite books, which I highly recommend to people, is to read Joel Salatin's The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs. speaks to this very directly. And I think for all of us who embrace a Christian perspective and a Christian theology of agriculture, we need to read this book to get a perspective outside ourselves. Mm -hmm. and so you're talking an entire agricultural scale move, and I think we would both agree that viewing it on a day-to-day -day basis and just some of the... Um, for lack of a better term, chaos in the agricultural world, uh, that does need to change. But one positive, you know, that that's gonna that's a huge movement. But one positive that is happening right now, and it just kind of ties it back to what we were talking about already, is regenerative agriculture, and that's more. We're talking more on the crop scale, as far as that goes, and what. As far as regenerative agriculture, it's become a buzzword. It's become a, a, a big thing within the ag industry. What is your view of how that can be done over the... What are some changes that can be done over the next 10 years that will actually allow uh, stewardship to happen? What, what opportunities are there that you see? I see such a long list of opportunities, I scarcely know where to begin to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Um, when I hosted Joel Salatin on my podcast, I asked him to repeat a number that I had heard him, a story that I had heard him describe several times before, which was that the rule of thumb is a hundred cow days of grazing, excuse me, a hundred bushels of corn yield production capacity is the equivalent of 400 cow days of grazing. So if you are in an environment where the regional county average is 170 bushel corn production, or let's just say 200 bushels for easy math, um, that translates to if you have a pasture that is well managed and uh, rotationally grazed in that ecosystem, you would have the equivalent of 800 cow days of grazing. When you do the math, Joel has done, I'm deferring to Joel's expertise because he's done this exercise in meetings dozens of times across the Midwest with numbers that the local farmers supplied. When you do the math of purchasing stalker steers at auction, grazing them during the summer months, selling them at auction prices in the fall. So this is no premium for grass-fed production, simply auction prices and auction prices. And you compare that with producing grain crops, and selling corn, the livestock always win in profitability. They are always more profitable. And you think about, and not only are they more profitable, but you start regenerating the landscape. You have all that local manure management. Think about all the infrastructure that becomes obsolete if you were to implement that on scale. You no longer need combines. You don't need tractors. You don't need planters. You don't need grain bins, you don't need feedlots, you don't need rail yards transporting grain. A lot of equipment and a lot of iron begins depreciating really rapidly. And so I think that this, these are possibilities that we should think about what the future might look like. I think something else that is also uh, desperately needed is, and this is perhaps... Uh, more of a perspective of regeneration from a food supply, sustainability, and a food security perspective is that we need to regionalize our production of actual food. Right now, we have three counties in California that produce 45% of our total fresh fruit and vegetable supply in the United States. And historically... California has had three significant competitive advantages. They have had um, 
a, a really great climate, essentially being a desert climate. They've had access to large quantities of water, and they've had access to a readily available labor pool of affordable labor. They are they have lost or are in the process of losing each of those three competitive advantages. In regards to climate, they are now putting many of their higher value crops like blueberries and raspberries are being put under high tunnels. Well, you can put up a high tunnel in Ohio or Iowa as inexpensively as you can, probably more inexpensively than you can in California. So all of a sudden, they've lost their climate advantage. They've already lost their water advantage, as we all know. They're constantly... Uh, every short snowpack, as we're having again this year, sends a fresh wave of anxiety through the farming community because they don't have any stable long-term water supply. And as you move further east, we do not have that problem. We have the opposite problem, of course. Um, and in terms of labor, um, there are already have been for half a dozen years severe shortages of labor, and labor is becoming very expensive. And as a result, there is the rapid development of robotics. Today, a significant portion of California's strawberry crop gets harvested by robots. Apples are being harvested by robots. We now have robots that have such sensitive sensors on their fingertips, they can pick a ripe blackberry without damaging it, without bruising it. A human almost can't do that. (laughs) Exactly. And so all of a sudden, that means that we now again have the potential to be really competitive in the Midwest with California production. I mean, we're two thirds of the way closer to the East Coast markets than California is. We have a significant freight advantage as well. And so I think those are all pieces that we need to look at in terms of regenerating our communities, regenerating an agrarian culture. Uh, For all of these pieces to happen, uh, and also the aspect of regenerating public health, for all these pieces to happen, we first need to regenerate farmer profitability. And I think to do that, we have to connect more directly with our consumers and not allow the middlemen to dictate what is actually happening in the marketplace as they do almost exclusively right now. And this brings us to the piece of consumer demand. There has been the story in, or the narrative in organic and biological agriculture that if we want to have significant changes in the agricultural sector, then we need to educate consumers to demand healthier choices, and that will bring about change. And I am of the unpopular opinion that that is completely wrong. And I've came come to that opinion as a result of asking the question, can I've asked people to point out, can anyone point me to an example where positive consumer demand created significant change? So I want to just unpack and qualify that statement or that question a little bit. So I'm speaking specifically about positive consumer demand as opposed to negative consumer demand. So negative consumer demand is what happened after Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle and meat consumption dropped by 40% in a matter of a couple of weeks. People were desiring to avoid something. Negative demand is what happens when there's an outbreak of salmonella or listeria on spinach, and spinach consumption drops really dramatically. That's negative demand. Positive demand is when people actually desire something, such as uh, lack of pesticides or nutrient density or something like that. And the second part of that statement, or question that I want to qualify, is significant change. What we desire to see in agriculture is not a gradual, slow 5% or 10% or 20% change in the next couple of decades. Quite frankly, we don't have time for that. We need to have a tide of change, a a complete sea tide change where we get 60% or 70 or 80% adoption of regenerative agriculture in the next 20 years. And I do not believe consumer demand is going to facilitate that because there is no evidence that I have observed a positive consumer demand ever creating that type of change. I mean, the best example that we have is organic certification, which today is still less than 10% of the marketplace in spite of 30 years of consumer demand. And we have to face the reality. The reality is, if consumer demand had any influence whatsoever, there would not be cardboard tomatoes on the grocery store shelf. 
we would not have strawberries that are picked green and shipped for 3,000 miles and then turn red with ethylene. And so I've come to the conclusion that in general, and the food and ag supply chain, it is not the consumers that drive change. It is instead the processors and the distributors. It is the distributors that want a tomato that can be shipped for 30 days. It is the distributors that want a, tom- a strawberry that is hard and firm and can be shipped and still be used by the consumer 20 days after it arrives. So it is really the, from my perspective, the producers, excuse me, the processors and the distributors that are dictating what they want for themselves for things that neither the producer nor the consumer desires. Because producers don't desire to produce poor quality tomatoes that people don't like or cantaloupes that are as hard as rocks. It's the processors and the distributors that desire those characteristics. And so for us to regenerate agriculture on scale, I think one of the pieces that needs to happen is we need to upset that imbalance of power because right now there is an imbalance of power where the consumer doesn't have power, the producers don't have power, the power primarily lies with the processors and distributors. So we have to shorten that loop. We have to shift that power balance. And one of the ways of shifting that power balance is cutting them out in large large enough significant enough volume of trade that they no longer have that influence. It doesn't have to be 100%. Maybe it only has to be 20%. I don't know what the number is. But I think we need to go, we need to have a regionalized, decentralized agriculture that can go much, be much more closely connected to the consumer in a large enough percentage of the total trade that it shifts the power balance. And then farmers will be able to, amongst other things, not get just a few cents on the dollar of the retail dollar value of the crop that they produce, but a much higher proportion of that, maybe 15 or 20%, which today almost exclusively goes to the processors and distributors. How do you upset that power balance? Who drives that? Is that the consumer or is that the farmer or is it, where does it come from? In my opinion, in the environment that we are in today, uh, hopefully this will change over time, but where we are today, it's up to the farmer or a group of farmers as a cooperative to be in charge of their own destiny. They have to step up and take responsibility. They are either going to take responsibility or they're going to get driven over. And they have collectively over the last 30 or 40 years, we have uh, been willing to assign that responsibility to producers and distributors, or excuse me, to processors and distributors, and then whine and complain about the price that we receive. Um, we can't continue to do that if we want to expect to have a different outcome. I read something where 40% of our corn goes into ethanol. Yep. That's awful. It's a really dumb, stupid idea. Yeah. Oh. So if you want abrupt change, wouldn't yanking all the subsidies take care of and make a lot of people look at regenerative ag? Sure it would, as would uh, taxing nitrogen to a point where it becomes really expensive to add. I think if there's one lever I would love to pull, it would be to tax nitrogen to the point that it makes it relatively unaffordable and persuade people to try to grow their own nitrogen. Because if you had to grow your own nitrogen, that would inspire the adoption of regenerative ag on an incredible scale. Because now you're planting legumes... Now you're planting legumes. Now you're planting cover crops. Now you have to build soil biology. Now you have to stop killing soil biology. You have to look at diversified crop rotations. Changes One lever changes the entire dynamics of the ecosystem. I would love to pull that lever. <laughs> um, Boy, would that cause an uproar. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But um, the reality is that subsidies have created. We have, a, we have a cheap food policy, not just here in the U.S., but in reality, many countries around the world heavily subsidize their agriculture and uh, externalize a lot of costs. And we have to have a different policy collectively, I think. And so certainly the subsidies um, maintain the status quo. And... I'm not particularly positive about the collective will power or the political capacity to change that system. 
I believe we need to change in spite of it and not because of it. And I think the pathway to achieving that, uh, there's a pathway to achieving this significant change that also satisfies the question. Uh, some people, this is particularly true in the organic certification community, are there's a, this constant criticism that, well, food also, this higher quality food also needs to be affordable to lower income people. And it also needs to be able to feed a growing world population. Well, anyone who's willing to look at the evidence with an unbiased perspective will soon conclude that um, production capacity is not a problem. We can produce more food regeneratively than we can with the current system. I think there's many producers who have proven that, who've demonstrated that. That's not really a question anymore, unless you want it to be a question. But the second aspect of making food affordable, I believe that question can also be answered with the best strategic pathway to scaling regenerative agriculture, which is this. In, in our consulting work at AEA, we take a very straightforward approach in answering answering the question of why a grower should work with us. It's very simple. We can help you make more money and be more profitable by managing plant nutrition differently. That's it. That's the conversation. What happens invariably when we start working with a grower is depending on the context. I mean, every farm and crop is, is slightly different, but usually it's very common in the first year or two, um, their input costs go up slightly because they now also have to start making investments for all the things that haven't been done for the last 80 years. Their soil might be completely depleted of molybdenum, for example. We have to start reapplying, some, making some of those investments that technically shouldn't be counted as a, an operating expense, but they usually are. And so usually you, we see this slight increase in expenses, but the expense dollars also shift in that uh, we are spending a lot less on fertilizers, we're spending a lot less on insecticides and fungicides, and instead more of that total budget gets spent on uh, reinvesting in the system. But then, over a couple of years, uh, the expense side goes down significantly, as we described when we're talking about photosynthesis. But even in the first year, while the expenses are increasing, the productivity is increasing at a pace significantly faster than the expenses. We, our goal is when we work with a farmer to get an increase in profitability immediately the first year, and we achieve that the great majority of the time. It doesn't always happen, but it usually happens. All of a sudden, that means the regenerative producer is the low-cost producer. They're the most efficient producer, they're producing the highest yields, and they are also the low-cost producer, which means that we can supply food to lower-income people around the world more efficiently and less expensively than the present status quo. That is the argument and that is the strategy for how we scale regenerative agriculture on scale. Because we know that many farmers around the country, I mean, the USDA data, I want to say this was 2017 data, but I could be mistaken. Uh, they reported that um, the average farmer across the U.S. loses an average of two thousand dollars, I think it was seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars per year, and um, if I recall correctly, eighty-five percent of all farms lost money seventeen out of the last twenty years. Well, that's not sustainable. No. Not even talking about that's degenerative. Yeah. <laughs> that is degenerating agricultural communities and. Many farmers don't see this in their balance sheets directly because they are consuming their equity. And so they don't see it directly in the balance sheet. But um, I believe the argument for broad or the strategy and the pathway for large scale adoption of regenerative agriculture is simply an economic strategy. It's an economic conversation. Farmers can be more profitable and they can make more money doing this than what they're doing right now. Do you see some exciting things that are changing right now that you've been since you were on last three years ago is there some change happening for the positive that excites you i would say this there is one significant change in the last three years which is that the conversation of regenerative agriculture has completely changed in scale and scope three years ago we first started using the term regenerative agriculture in 2011 
and people didn't even know what the term meant at that point. Um, and people, for that matter, are still debating about what that term means, uh, which I think is a healthy debate. But uh, three years ago, the term regenerative agriculture had not really entered into the mainstream narrative or was just beginning to. And today it is a part of the mainstream narrative in agricultural publications and so forth. So I think the growing awareness and the desire is there on a scale that hasn't been there before because Charles Walters uh, had this quote where he used to say that people leave their senses as a group and they come to their senses one at a time. And <laughs> I think there's a good argument for that to be made in our recent uh, political debacles. But uh, that as an aside, I think there are larger numbers of people coming to their senses one at a time in the last couple of years than there have been ever before in quite a long time. People are starting to ask questions and question the status quo. Mm-hmm. Well, and I might be making a stretch here, but in the farming community, part of making that that uh, connection or coming to their senses, um, and Wendell Berry said it in our podcast with him, the eyes to acres ratio. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the common themes that you talk about in your podcast as well is um, once a farmer takes the time to actually walk in their fields yep. and observe and this might sound out there, listen and find out they'll, they'll, they'll find out more in that walk than any science can give them. And that, and they come to that realization at that point. We've had this interesting observation, um, at AEA. We now, I don't have actual, I uh, don't keep close track of numbers, but we've worked with several thousand farms over the last 15 years. And there is a group of farmers that consistently produces extraordinary results, even when other farmers in their regions don't seem to. They have the same challenges, they might be growing the same crops, but they produce different outcomes. And I've studied those these farmers and tried to ask the question, what makes their operation different? Why are they so much more successful than their peers? And there are several different characteristics that these exceptionally successful farm managers have, but one of them that really stands out is they develop an empathy for the landscape. They develop an empathy for the plants and the wild animals and the birds that are there exactly the same way as a dairy farmer develops an empathy for his dairy cows. We think it's perfectly acceptable and normal that a really good dairy farmer can walk through his dairy herd in the morning when, uh, or be in the parlor and watch them as they come through milking. And he can say, there's something off with that cow. And there is nothing visual that he can point to. It's just a gut instinct. We all know that good dairy farmers can do that. We think that's normal. For some reason, we think it should be different with plants, but it's really not. These exceptional farm managers all have the capacity to walk into a pasture or walk into a block of trees and say, there's something off with this field. I don't know what it is, but there's something off. It's this gut intuitive sense. It is those farmers that connect with their plants, that connect with the landscape, that connect with their livestock, that produce the greatest results and the greatest, and that have the fastest transitions and have the greatest successes. I believe this is a skill that we should actively foster and actively train in and try to develop. So it's a skill equally as much as uh, being a good, being good at bookkeeping or being good at um, maintaining dairy nutrition or dairy cow health or whatever the case might be. Well, and part of that change that may be somewhat controversial is take that dairy farmer or take the guy that walks out in his pasture or block of trees. If a dairy farmer walks in a herd of 100 cows, he might be able to pick out the one that mm-hmm. has a problem. If he walks in a herd of 10,000 cows. It's not going to happen very easily. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Same Be- with 10,000 acres. Because or, yeah. there is a relationship required. There's a relationship required. For those 100 cows, he sees those same 100 cows every day or just about every day. He's there. He knows them. Mm-hmm. And there's. Uh, I'll give you an extreme example. That's all the way um, extreme. 
is an apple farmer in Washington, apple producer we've been working with for the last three years. And for this one variety of apples is really worth a lot of money. It's worth about $100, or excuse me, $1,000 a bin. The regional average in Washington is about 50 bins per acre. And we started working with him. The first two years, he did 100 bins an acre. He doubled the yield. But I credit that yield response not just to the AEA program. We, we were able to help him make some differences. But he made a point of spending at least an hour a day walking through those trees and just asking the trees, hey, what's going on? Just, just being present. The third year, he did 150 bins an acre. That was this last growing season. His nutrition management hasn't really changed. Much of what he's doing is still the same as it was, but he's now triple the average yield. So you can do the math, $1,000 a bin, 150 bins an acre. His crop is worth more than marijuana. <laughs> and that's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> and so I believe those results and that success came about purely as a result of his presence, his attention, his empathy for these trees, trying to understand what's happening, what's going on, how can I prune a bit differently, do these trees need more shade, do they need more water? He was he was babying those trees exactly the same way that a great dairy farmer babies his dairy cows, and they responded accordingly. Mm-hmm. So I, to, I guess, tie it all together, we've talked about regenerative agriculture, and we talked earlier on the scientific side, the crux of regenerative agriculture. And then we talked a little bit on the economic side, the crux of regenerative agriculture. What I'm hearing is that really when you boil it entirely down to the bare minimum or basics, the crux of regenerative agriculture is having a relationship with the land and the animals that you work with and being the steward that you talked about earlier rather than the Dominion. That's a beautiful summary, and I completely agree. There's a quote that I really like that speaks to this from Otto Scharmer, who studied leadership in emerging leaders at MIT. And I'll paraphrase a little bit. He says that the outcome of an intervention has nothing to do with the skills of the intervener. It has everything to do with the place within from which the intervener comes. And when you think about that, much of our human interactions where we have a conversation with someone, we try to change their mind about uh, which restaurant we're going to or whatever the case might be. Many, even very trivial interactions that we have with other people, in some ways we are trying to change their minds or we're trying to have a conversation about something. Those are all interventions. They're very minor interventions, but they are nonetheless interventions. In the same way, when... We put on a foliar application. That's an intervention. When we give a cow a homeopathic treatment, that's an intervention. So going back to that statement, the outcome of an intervention has nothing to do with the skills of the intervener. It has everything to do with the place within from which the intervener comes. So as you just so beautifully summarized, if we are coming from a place within of a desire to steward, and a desire to have an empathic connection with the landscape and with the, the, these living organisms, this creation that we are stewarding, our outcomes are going to be completely different than if we approach it from a purely mechanistic perspective. And your outlook is going to be completely different as well. Absolutely. You will see things that you will not see from a mechanistic point of view. Mm-hmm. And feel things that you definitely will not feel. <laughs> <laughs> from a mechanistic point of view. Mm-hmm. I think that's a beautiful place to wrap up right there. And if I'm going to take anything out of the, this, it's you know just on a higher level. It's that relationship with the land. I think we all view it every day, um, but trying to uh, steward that along ourselves is what we want to do as well. If you want to dig into this a little bit more deeply, I think there are plenty of biblical references that we can um, dig into. But there's, I already mentioned Joel Salatin's book, The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs. Um, There's also a book whose title is escaping me at the moment, I think uh, titled Health for All, 
or health for all things, something like that. I'll have to look that up and give you the information. But if you specifically want to dig into uh, developing empathy for plants and developing empathy for the landscape, I highly recommend there's a trilogy of three books that was written by Stephen Herod Buhner. And um, I, everyone who I've recommended these books loves all three of them. But uh, I would perhaps begin with the last of the three that he wrote, which is titled Plant Intelligence. And in this book, he describes how plants have these extensive neural networks. They, they use the same neurotransmitters as we use in our brains. And they have the capacity to communicate with the environment and make intelligent decisions. And they can communicate with us and they can perceive what our intentions are. It's, uh, it may seem out in left field, but it only seems that way because we've not, we're not familiar with the science. We haven't been exposed to it. But this is all peer-reviewed published science. So I highly recommend those books. Thank you for having me on. Really appreciate it. Thank you, John.